Hey, what's happening? This is your host, Tinto. And before we get started on this weekend's episode, I'd like to give a shout out to everybody that got me coffees, starting with you, young Chidzi. Um, thank you so much for your generosity. Five solid coffees. And your comment there reads, me and the wifey be having date nights just to listen to the episodes. Thank you so much, guys. Then next up, I've got Pre2, who got me a coffee. Thank you for your contribution. Uh, you didn't leave a comment. Then I've got Tishi today, Bogus. Thank you so much again, once again, for your generosity. You're, you're a constant support of the podcast love you to bits um then i got tadiwando zia uh three solid coffees and your comment there reads we are deprived comrade we need content well here it is and then last but not least we got chi chi who got me an incredible number of coffees and your comment there reads missing the podcast hope all is well can't wait for the next episode If you'd like to support the podcast in a similar way, please head over to www.buymeacoffee.com forward slash feeling station and give as your spirit leads. Remember, there is nothing too small to support the podcast that you've grown to love. With that out of the way, let's get straight into this week's episode and please approach this with caution because it has a trigger warning. This episode of The Feeling Station is not suitable for people that have experienced sexual grooming, sexual abuse, suicidal thoughts and attempts, drug use and emotional manipulation. If any of these are likely to trigger you, please be kind to yourself and skip this episode. I promise you, next weekend's will be lighter. Hello? Hi, Tinto. Yo, what up? Nothing. How are you doing? So you sent me a message five minutes ago, yeah, and you're like, "Ready with yeah. you?" And I'm like, "Yo, I'm normally good with time, but Gary uh-huh. is giving me this pressure, yeah, that I decided oh, to you? call one minute before time <laughs> just so that your heart can be settled, <laughs> and my heart can also be pressure? settled. Of course, I felt the pressure. I was like, "Hey," because yeah, I'm, <laughs> I. Yeah. I, I'm a I'm a very punctual person. Hi, boy. One of my biggest one of my biggest pet peeves is being kept waiting. Like if you really want to piss me off, yeah. um, keep me waiting. But like you're gonna you find put me, me under really pressure. Upset. We've got five minutes. Even now, <laughs> we still have one minute. <laughs> I hope one of your lessons in this is not be punctual. Ah. <laughs> anyway, welcome to the feeling station. Oh, thank you, Tinto. Thank you. For those listening to this for the first time, this is a romantic family and friendship breakup podcast showcase. Sh- oh, Jesus! Did you hear that chop? <laughs> Yeah, mm. Let's try that the again. Is, the <laughs> is, <that's> <laughs> English bundles have run out <laughs> because of this pressure you gave me. <laughs> okay. The tongue is going. <laughs> for those listening to this podcast for the first time, it's a romantic family and friendship breakup podcast showcasing stories that people would like to talk about with a view to give you lessons from their experiences. Now, I hope you find today's story entertaining, but more importantly, meaningful. Uh, The podcast is popular for two main reasons. The first being, I do my best to keep my guests anonymous, which brings me to the fun part for this today. The name I'm going to give you for the duration of the episode. Are you ready, my friend? Yes, I am. So the name that I have for you comes from the lovely country of Lesotho. And Mm -hmm. the name is Naledi. Okay, Naledi. I love it. And Naledi means the morning shining star. Oh, I love it. I, I love w- it. And I will tell you this, when I have a second baby, I'm mm-hmm. going to call and I'm hoping it's a girl. I'm going to call her mm-hmm. that lady. Uh, all right, yeah, you know. Because I love that I love name it. so much. Right. And what are you calling the name of the person you are talking about today? Um, well, because it's two different people that are involved. Mm. I'm going to call them, I'm going to call them Joe and Love. Joe and Love. You know, like... Yeah, like mm. from you. <laughs> hey, are these are these two boys you're in love with, or this is a friendship breakup? No, it's a family breakup. Family breakup. Man, yeah. Okay. Mm. Okay. So we got Joe and we got Love, and you are a lady. And mm-hmm. the second reason why the podcast is doing great is their real life lessons that people learn from the story that you're going to share today. So, what would you like those listening to your episode today to learn? Okay, so my first lesson is sometimes it be your own people. Mm. Hey, sometimes it be your own people that be doing the most, yeah? Yep, sometimes it really be your own people. Mm. 
Got a second yeah. one? Um, my second lesson is sometimes you need to come to a point where you forgive, mm. not because they apologized or because they acknowledged the pain that they caused you, mm. but because your soul deserves peace. Amen. Amen. You can yeah. say that again. My my mm. mantra for this year is choose peace dot 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 always in caps. True. With an exclamation mark. True. That's very true. You got a third one? Uh yeah. My third and my final lesson is don't engrave your trials in marble and your triumphs in sand. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> hey, my Let me tell you something here. Uh-huh. I did literature and I passed very well, well, O oh, level at a straight uh-huh. A. Yeah. Uh-huh. This uh-huh. line is giving me Shakespeare vibes. Yeah. Uh, but, no, but but even even true. though I I did Shakespeare <laughs> and all them and I passed with flying colors. Ah, this mm-hmm. one I don't understand. Let me read it slowly. Don't engrave uh-huh. your trials in marble uh-huh. and your triumphs in sand. In sand. Uh-huh. Aye, 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 uh-huh. aye, aye. In English, I beg. Uh, well, it just means don't um, take the bad things that happen to you and run with them forever and then forget about the good things in your life. Ah. <laughs> yeah. Did you do literature, Naledi? I did, but I failed. <laughs> <laughs> you missed a trick. Your teacher, your teacher made a mistake. Because, yeah. I think so, too. Ah, I think do. so, too, because... They gave me a D and I was shook. Imagine. And I was shook because in class I was the top student. So mm, something was not make sure. No. Something was just not make sure. Yes, and, and I can I can I can relate because when you read <laughs> what the actual sentence is, which is don't engrave your trials in marble and your triumphs in sand, mm-hmm. it went over my head. But then when you translated it for for, 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 for the simpler man like myself. You're basically mm-hmm. saying it doesn't um um it, it means that don't take the bad things that happen to you and run with them forever and yeah. forget the good triumphs. Yeah. I guess yeah. this is this this translates to one of the lines that um that I think comes from Julius Caesar. Mm-hmm. And it goes mm-hmm. the good that men do um no 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 the evil that men do lives on mm-hmm. with them and the good is often turned with their bones. Mm-hmm. Or or, yeah, so, or or something like that, and this is exactly yeah. what they say to say that the good things that you you do mm-hmm. are forgotten very quickly. Exactly. Um, and then the evil that men do lasts forever. Exactly. And I guess somebody, this is what yeah, this is what this is kind of relating to, right? Yeah. Somebody once told me that you know sometimes in life you can do a hundred things right yeah. and one thing wrong, and mm-hmm. everybody can forget the hundred that you've done mm-hmm. and only remember the one thing that you've done wrong. Absolutely. So I feel like it's just human nature, you know, that sometimes when we come to like bad situations, yeah. you get to a point where you're literally just running with the bad stuff and you forget about the good stuff that yeah. you have going on for you. Amen to that. Imagine yeah. That. Um. Right. Let's get cracking then. So, uh, the three lessons we have, just to recap. First one is sometimes it'd be your own people, mm-hmm. and then lesson number two. Sometimes you need to come to a point where you forgive, not that they apologize or acknowledge the pain, but because your soul deserves peace. Oh man, mm-hmm. that resonates so much with me even right now. And then number mm-hmm. three, don't engrave your trials in marble or and your triumph no don't engrave your trials in marble and your triumph in sand that is really mm-hmm. really powerful right now lady mm-hmm. come on let's get into it so because this is a family breakup it becomes a little mm-hmm. difficult for me to 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 build where did you meet this person blah 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 so this is literally your ship to steer so ah all right joe and love where do where does that connection begin Okay, so love is my sister, my Mm. blood sister. Mm -hmm. We're born together, like born of the same mother and father. And Joe is my brother-in-law. Yeah, my sister's husband. So so Joe is married to love? Yes, they're married. Okay, yeah. Uh So the whole thing dates back to 2015. I was just fresh out of high school. And um, just trying to figure out my whole life. Like, you know, that whole thing that you're not really from a rich family. Like your parents have been trying the best for you. And 
now you're out of high school and you're asking yourself, okay, what next? Because maybe there isn't as much money to take mm. you to the school that you want to go to, right? Mm. So anyways, um, love stays out of the country. Let's say for the story, she stays in Sweden. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so um, obviously because love is my sister, we talk to each other very often and she's been asking me like, what are your plans for the future? This, that, and the other. And then I tell her, no, I'd really love to study further. This, that, and the other, da, 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 you know how it goes. And then she says to me, okay, no, since you've taken the gap year, because 2015 was my gap year, maybe what? Maybe by the end of the year, when things are looking up for me a little better, you can come this side and what? And join us and, mm. It's not going to be a problem. You can just, what? You can stay with us maybe for a year whilst you're still like finding your footing in this new country and stuff like that. And then maybe after the year you can move out, like if you manage to find work or something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So at this point, it seems like it's a pretty brilliant plan because my lady and love are quite close. Like we've had a very close relationship. She's my sister who I'm really, really close with. And we're generally just fond of each other. Yeah. Mm. But we haven't been living together for quite some time now because she moved away like a couple of years ago. So yeah. the relationship has mostly been over the phone, you know? Mm. So anyways, fast forward comes end 2015. Um, they come over, Love and her family come over for the holidays. Um, it's a good time, this, that, and the other. And then just before 2015 ends, they decide to what? To go back to Sweden. And then Love says to me, now lady, she says, um, it will probably be best for you to what? To come with us already now. And then we go back together so that you get acquainted to the whole like new place and stuff like that before the school year starts, 2016 starts. Mm. And it seems like it's a great idea. So that's exactly what happens. I travel with them back to Sweden. Um, this is around, I think around about the 29th of December at this point in time. And mm. then it so happens that Joe also has a younger sibling who is also like not really having a good time down here. So he also decides that what he's going to bring his young brother back with him to Sweden. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah, we all travel back together and everything's fine. Then come New Year's Eve of 2015, we decide like to have like a small house party. We have this really nice house in a good suburb. So it's fairly like a good place and there's enough space for everybody. Like, I mean, when I got there, I had my own room and stuff like that. So it was quite a comfortable situation, I can say, you know. Mm -hmm. So we have a like a house party, like I said, have a house party and there's a couple of the friends that come over. There is a lot of drinking that goes on that night. Like we get like super, super drunk, like to the point that I passed out that night. Yeah. Mm. Um, and then the following morning on the 1st, I wake up and I am on the bathroom. I'm on the toilet seat mm -hmm. and I am undressed and I'm undressed, but like completely undressed. And I don't really remember how I got undressed. Yeah. Mm. Um, okay. So I'm like, okay, whatever. I was probably really drunk because like I'm saying, there was a lot of drinking that went on that night. Mm. So anyways, I get up, um, get a towel, wrap myself in a towel, and then I go into my room. I get some proper sleep because I'd obviously spent the whole night sitting on the toilet and I'm undressed, yeah? Mm. So the thing is, I feel really weird, like somebody's been touching me or something like that, yeah? But then I'm also thinking, oh, okay, it was a really wild night. Like maybe it's just body pains, you know what I mean? And okay, so I let it go. And then following that, it's just life as usual. So, so this is now. So, so hang on mm -hmm. a sec. Mm -hmm. You woke up and you felt like you'd been touched. 
Yeah. Like, you know, like when somebody's been fondling you and, you know, that, you know, that, that after sex feeling that you have. The after sex feeling I would probably feel on my penis. Yeah, so for that's, you, that's, that's... So for you, the after sex feeling is this in your cookie? Yeah, and my whole body, I just feel like okay, I've been I, touched because... I had to clear uh-huh. that up because uh-huh. I can't imagine having a heavy night. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm kind of drunk, etc., etc. But remembering that somebody brushed my arm because that's a touch. Obviously, you know, obviously you know, like not. How many uh-huh. times would your arm need to have been touched for you to remember <laughs> it the next morning? So I just needed to yeah. be very clear. So yeah. what you're describing is you had the feeling that somebody had had sex with you. Yeah, that type of a feeling. That type of a feeling. Okay. But then at the same time, I'm putting it off because at this point in time, the person that I was dating was in a different country. So there was obviously, I hadn't been intimate with anybody for a long time. So that's why that feeling was so apparent for me. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So um, this is now January of 2015 and you know, universities only start in February. Yeah. Yeah. So anyways, time goes by and then now it's time for everybody to go back to work, you know, and I'm just there. I'm really bored. I'm bored out of my head because I literally spend the day at home waiting for uni to start and all of that. So most of the times I'm the one who's doing the housekeeping and whatnot because that's what I can mostly entertain myself with. Mm. So now the thing is, Joel works from home and Love gets up every morning and goes to work. Mm-hmm. So most of the times uh, during the day in the house, it's just Joel and I. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I try not to be too much of a distraction. Like I just let him do his work and then maybe I'll take some tea to him, you know, like just to be helpful, you know, because one of the things that my mom said to me when I left was when you get that side, I don't want to hear that you're being lazy and yeah. all of that. You know how our African moms are yeah, like, yeah, yeah. let's get there and be a helpful somebody, you mm-hmm, know? Mm-hmm. So that was generally the situation. And, I'm just, I'm generally not a TV person. So I would be mostly in my room or something, you know, just on the internet or something. I would never like be watching TV or anything. So anyways, um, at some point, Joe starts to act weird, right? But in my head, I'm not taking this thing seriously. Yeah. You know, like when you build a certain relationship with somebody in your head like you have taken this person and you've put them in a certain category like say you meet somebody and you tell yourself that no this person is my friend you don't see anything beyond that such that if they start acting some type of way towards you like it doesn't register to you in your head that okay because you have put them in a certain shelf i don't know if i'm making sense you're making a lot of sense. In what way was he starting to act weird towards you? Okay, so sometimes maybe I would be in the kitchen and I am doing the dishes and he would come and he would slap me on the butt or mm, something like mm, that. Mm, 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 mm. But in my head, in my head, like, look, I'm not, I'm not taking this thing to be anything more than it is. You know what I mean? Which is what? It's just, which is what it's, it's no, we're building to that. We're building. To that. I, I, I'm, I'm getting, we're building it. But in your mind, you say you're uh-huh. not taking a slap on your butt as anything, but well, well, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get into your mind to find out what, what that slap uh-huh. to your butt meant to you in that moment. Well, to, this person is generally a really goofy character, right? So, because to me, I've taken him and I have made him the brother that I've never had. I'm not thinking that there's more to this. You know what I mean? Like, it's not registering. And now, like, when I sit down and I think of a lot of these things, right? 
I sometimes for a long time, like I blamed myself because I said to myself, no, I should have seen this thing coming. I should have done A, B, C and D, right? But unfortunately, maybe I was naive at the time because I was what? I was 19. So, and I was quite new to the whole dating thing, you know, so I really didn't quite understand you know that when a man does this and that to you this Mm. is what it means you know and like i'm saying i was 19 i was dating somebody and my whole family was aware of this person that i was dating you know so i didn't really um think much of it you know like i didn't take it and put it in my head or think to talk to somebody about it you know Mm. so uh, i would just okay, whatever, like, I really wouldn't take it to heart, you know what I mean? Like, it would be just, okay, whatever, fine. Mm. And then he started doing weird things, like, when I'm not looking, like, maybe we would go out, when I'm not looking, he would take pictures of my butt, uh, or take pictures of me when I'm looking back, or something like that. Or maybe when we go to the mall, we all go out together to the mall, and then he would like watch me when I'm walking away or something, you know. And then maybe later on, send me a message like, tell me, oh, you have a great body, this, that, and the other. But like I'm saying, because I was not seeing him in that light. It meant very little to me, you know. And then so, he would like... So how uh-huh. would you respond if he said to you, got a great body? What was your response to him? Uh, it would be just like, oh, okay, thanks. Yeah, I've been working out, you know, like just try and make the conversation casual between yeah. two people that just live together because I'm not thinking of you as more than my brother, you know. Mm. And the fact that him, and I, we had like, we had an easy relationship because love, my sister is more of an uptight person, you know? So mm-hmm. like, I couldn't really talk to her much about a lot of things, but with him, he was a lot much more open. Like I'm saying, he was a very goofy character. So I felt like I could talk to him yeah. often. So he had a way like of worming these little, like smug little things into the conversation, you know? Um, and making it seem like it's okay, you know what I mean? Sort of like now when I look back at it, Tinto, I can say that I was sexually groomed. I can look back at it and I say like I was groomed, like this person worked me over time, you know what I mean? Mm. Like sort of manipulated me like in the head, you know what I mean? Like somebody just gets into your head and... They because they have these ulterior motives and they start to like act things out and make it want to look like you're an accomplice to it, but you are not thinking it that far. I don't know. Like like I'm saying that after when the aftermath of the whole thing hit me, it just I sat there because I was now a lot much older and so I asked myself, Am I stupid or Am I naive? What exactly is it? Because I should have actually seen this thing coming, but I didn't. You know what I mean? Mm. I really didn't. So anyways, the whole thing of taking pictures, like sometimes he would open my bedroom door when I'm sleeping and take pictures of me, you know, and then he would send those pictures to the person that I was dating at the time, you know? Because he had contact with this person. So he would send him those pictures. Like I'm saying that we would go out sometimes and then maybe I turn around and then he would start taking pictures of my butt, this, that, and the other. And then that guy that I was dating at the time would say to me, you know, I find it really funny why your brother-in-law does A, B, C, and D. And so it broke up, broke out into a whole argument with me and this person. And I said to him, no, it's pretty disgusting that you would think of something like this, you know? And then he would tell me that, no, you know, I'm a man. I know how um, a man's brain works, this, that, and the other. And I was actually upset. Like, how could you say that about my brother? Because like I'm saying, I had a really close relationship with Joe at this point, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. We were, we were thick as thieves because he was literally the brother that I never had, 
he was just so cool, you know? So that's why it was so easy for me to brush aside all of these things that had that he had been doing, you know, like that should have been signs to me, but it wasn't. So anyways, um, February comes and then school starts. Yeah. But because I'm new to this place, right. Mm. Um, he usually takes me to and fro school every morning. Mm -hmm. So that's what would happen. Yeah. So, you know, like in uni, sometimes your classes don't start maybe until later on in the day. Yeah. yeah. So on this one day, I go about my morning the usual way. I think my first class was around 1130. So I go into the kitchen, I make breakfast and then I take something to his office. I'm like, do you want some tea? Do you want coffee? What would you like for breakfast? Mm. He tells me what he wants. And then I go to the kitchen. I make him the breakfast. And then I go and I drop it off in the room that he was using as his office. So just as I'm leaving, he says to me, no, you can what? Come and keep me company since I'm also going to be having my breakfast in here. You can just grab a chair and come and sit here. Yeah. Mm. And we can chat. And I'm like, oh, okay, it's fine. So I go get my breakfast in the kitchen. I go back and I sit with him in the office. And he's just playing some funny videos on YouTube. And we're just having a casual conversation, you know. So, yeah, the breakfast is finally done. Maybe some 10, 15 minutes later. And then I'm like, okay, it's fine. You can give me a plate so that I can go and wash up and leave the kitchen clean and then I'm going to go take a shower and then you can go and drop me off at school. He's like, no, it's fine. Um, You were watching this video. So he was playing a video on one of the screens, like in the room. Because there was like multiple screens in the room. He says mm. to me, no, it's fine. Right? Let me take the plates to the kitchen for you so that you can finish up the video. Um, And then when I come back, you can then go. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, fine, whatever. So I sit there and then it so happened that the desks, the way that they were set up, right? If you come out of the room and I'm still inside of the room, my back is to the door. So I can't really see you okay. when you come back. Yeah, yeah. You get what I mean? Yeah? yeah, yeah. So he leaves the room and then when he comes back into the room, I don't really see him yeah? yeah coming back into the room mm -hmm. um so he walks into the room i'm still seated there and i'm staring at the computer watching these videos on youtube yeah and then i suddenly feel like somebody pushing me down on the chair yeah mm. that i'm on he pushes me down on the chair and then he starts touching me in a sexual way he starts touching me. I was wearing a skirt and a vest. And then he starts touching me. So obviously, like, I flinch. And I'm like, what's going on? And then he whispers to me. And he says, no, just relax. And I'm like, no, please stop. But he doesn't stop. So he continues, like, trying to force me down on the chair, yeah? But I manage, like, to get up. So I'm walking away, right? But he's running after me. And then he pushes me like at a corner somewhere in the house. I'm walking towards the kitchen because I wanted to run out and go to the backyard of the house because mm. there was somebody who was staying in the backyard. So I was going to run out and go there. Yeah. Because at this point I have seen that, okay, the situation is actually what it's actually escalating. Right. Mm. So, Unfortunately, in the kitchen, there's what there's like a screen door and you can only open the screen door from outside. So you have to put your hand outside and twist the key from outside. So at this moment, this person is holding me. Yeah, you are touching me and you are trying to pull me back into the house and I'm trying to um, open the screen door so that I can run out. And obviously I'm panicked at this moment. You know what I mean? Mm. I'm super, super panicked. And I can literally feel this person getting an erection from behind me. But at this point, you know, I don't even have the strength to scream because there's so many things going on in my, in my head. Like what's going on? Like this is so sudden. Like I don't 
fully understand. You know what I mean? So I then the keys then fall out. The keys fall into the outside. So now I can't even bend over to pick up the keys. So I manage to push him off of me. And then I run into the bathroom that's near the closest bathroom. Because remember, this is a really big house. It's quite a big house. So there's a couple of bathrooms in this house. So I run into that bathroom um, and I close the door. Yeah, I close the door and I lock the door from inside because there mm. was a key from inside. And then I sit against the door so that he can come in. And then he comes and he knocks on the door and he says to me, let me in so that we can shower together. And, you know, in this moment, I'm asking myself, like, what on earth is going on? Like, there is so many things going on in my head, you know, like, it's just, it's a lot going on. Like, I just, I can't fathom, like, what just happened. You know mm. what I mean? Mm. I, I can't come to terms with it because it's just so many things going on. So I think after about an hour of me being seated by that door, um, I finally got up and I took a shower and then I come out. I get into the room, in my room. Um, I get dressed and as I start leaving, because there was an exit from my room that would lead to outside the house so I could get out of the house without using the main door. Mm. So as I am leaving, he hears the garage door opening and then he runs after me and then he says, no, wait for me. Let me take you to school. At this point, I am so numb. I don't know what just happened. Mm. So I just say, okay. And then I get into the car. It's an awkward ride. Um, and then he says to me on the way to school, he's like, no. Please don't tell anybody about what happened. You see, when I was growing up, we used to have a helper. Um, and when I was about nine years old, she would touch my penis until it would get hard. And then she would sit on top of me and do A, B, C, D to me. So I'm like, okay, but why are you telling me all of this? You know? Mm. So I'm like, oh, okay. Okay. I, I I remember that I didn't say anything. And then we get to like the car park at school. So I just got out and I got my bag and I went straight to the library. So that entire day, I didn't even attend any of my classes. I just spent the day in the library, like sitting in between shelves because there was like carpeting at our school. So I just spent the whole day sitting there. I couldn't cry. I couldn't do anything. Like, I was numb. Like, you know what I mean when I say, like, you feel numb. Like, there's so many things going on in your head. You don't know, am I dreaming? Did this happen? Yeah. What is going on? You know what I mean? Like, it's yeah, just yeah. a lot to process. It's just a lot to process. And the worst part of it all for me is that I have literally always sucked at making friends. So at this point, I literally didn't even have a friend at school. It was literally just me. It would be just me be going for classes and going back home. So mm. I didn't even have a friend. So nobody even noticed that day that I didn't attend my classes. You know what I mean? So, yeah. And then around five o'clock on that same day, um, Jo sends me a message. She says to me, are you done with your classes? And then I responded and I said, yes, I'm done. And then he says, oh, okay, I've been waiting for you outside at the usual spot where I usually pick you up so you can come through. And then I'm like, okay. So I get out and I go and for sure he's there. And he has this little box that has like candy and stuff and then he hands it to me and then he says to me no i'm really sorry for this morning this that and the other you know mm. so i just take it and i'm quiet we get back to the house and love is already back from work mm. so at this point like i'm like i've been saying i'm still feeling numb but at this point now that i'm back like in the house like or a lot of these emotions like just start coming to me, you know, mm. like I start like materializing everything that has happened, you know, and 
I'm thinking, okay, so this, that, and the other happened. Like, I was almost raped this morning. This, that, and the other happened, you know? And I just started being very emotional. Mm. So once we got back to the house, I just went into the room. I remember I didn't come out for supper that night. And surprisingly, love, my sister, she didn't even bother to come and check on me. Nothing. Did she notice something was wrong? No, but obviously, if I usually come out for dinner, like... You should be concerned to come and say, oh, hey, we're eating now. Are you not going to come? You mm. know what I mean? But that didn't happen. So this whole thing of me just being in my room went on, I think, for like a week. So at this point, I wasn't even going for classes. I wasn't doing anything. I would just literally just stay in the room. So I don't know. Maybe she would assume that I left and I came back, you know. But she literally wouldn't, like, come to check me and ask, like, are you okay or what? You know what I mean? Mm. So at this point, I started to feel, like, really suicidal. I started to feel, like, really, really suicidal at this point. Like, I was even, like, checking out on the internet, like ways to kill myself like really fast and stuff like that you know and because joe knew what had happened he was the only person like in the house who could see that no this person is not okay you know what i mean Mm. this person is not okay so one evening i think a, a week later after this whole thing had happened he goes to my sister, love, when they're in the bedroom. Like, it was now, like, really super late. And I think around about 9 o'clock. He goes to my sister. They're in their room. And I'm really, I'm not sure what it is that he says to her. But he kind, he kind of, like, fills her in on what happened, yeah? Because after that, she immediately came to my room. And I remember I was curled up in a ball on the bed and I was crying my eyes out at this point. And then she came into the room and then she says to me, no, Joe told me what happened. I'm really sorry, this, that and the other. And she starts apologizing. And then she says to me, no, please don't tell mom and dad. I don't want you to go back home. I want you to stay here. I like having you here, this, that and the other, you know. And she's kind of like apologizing for the whole thing. And at this point, for me, I am assuming that Joe has told her the truth and nothing but the truth. Mm. You know what I mean? That's just my assumption, Mm. you know? Mm -hmm. So we never really get to sit down and I explain my side of the story and he explains his side of the story. It just ends there at her saying, no, I'm sorry, da-da-da-da, you know what I mean? So it ends. So she's heard Uh your version, which at this point... No, she's... Mm. she's heard his version because remember he's the one who goes and tells her yeah, yeah. she just comes to me and she starts saying i'm sorry she really doesn't give me a platform like to say she anything. doesn't really ask exactly she doesn't really ask for the details she just says to me no i'm sorry this is your home you're supposed to feel safe here i'm sorry that this has happened please don't tell mom and dad that yeah, yeah, this yeah. has happened you know what i mean mm. yeah so that's the type of situation that it is so, um, the, now that that's happened, like, I get, like, a form of relief, I guess. I don't know what exactly I can call it. Yeah. I get a form of relief, and I somehow find the strength to somehow carry on with things being as they are. I don't know. It is what it is. So I just carry on and I don't tell anybody about this whole thing. Yeah. Mm. But every now and again, like it would visit me. Like I would have like depressive episodes, like times when I can't get out of bed for a week straight. I can't even put clothes on and I'm just there, you know, and nobody's really noticing, but my mental health is just going to trash at this point. Like, it's just really going to trash. But, you know, I'm just I'm just sticking it out because also at the same time, I know that things are not rosy at home. So mm. if I give up on this and I go back home, then what's going to become of my life? You know what I mean? Yeah. 
So I'm just there and I'm sticking it out. And then um, come November of that year, um, I got sick. I got really, really sick. And I had to have an operation done. Yeah. Mm. So it so happens that my mother then comes because I had to have somebody to take care of me post-op. My mother comes and it's a really hard time for me. I am sick at this point and then I sort of like get depressed all over again about that whole situation because unfortunately the grooming did not stop like all throughout the year. It had even escalated to things like he would open the door when I'm taking a shower or stuff like that. He would, he just continued doing like these weird little things, you know? Mm. And at this point, like, I couldn't even talk about it, you know, because I'm under the impression that, no, my sister knows, so she should have had a talk with him and it should stop. And like I'm saying, also in the back of my mind, I'm also thinking, no, if I make a big deal out of this thing, then it means I'm going to go back home and I'm just going to be at home sitting with nothing to do. So I may as well just take it. You know what I mean? Mm. So anyways, in November, my mom comes because I was going to have this whole operation done. And I'm just depressed at this point in time. Like, I'm just really, really, really depressed. Um, so enter into the story my other sister, my eldest sister. So she also stays in a different country. So post the whole operation thing um my mom tells her that no my lady is really depressed this that and the other i think maybe once she's feeling better you should invite her over and then spend some time with her maybe it will be good for her like to get like a change of scenery this that and the other you know what i mean what did mom say the reason for you being depressed was no she thought it was the whole operation thing because remember i just got sick like out of yeah. the blue i've been a healthy child all of my life mm. and then mm. the next moment i'm really sick you know what i mean mm. so anyways my other sister's like okay no that's a good idea this that and the other so she's like okay so once i was feeling bitter um mom leaves mom comes back home and then my other sister flies me out to where she is so I go there, but at this point, like I'm saying, I'm really depressed and this whole thing is just eating me up on the inside. You know what I mean? Mm. So when I get to where she is, I confide in her and I tell her like everything that happens, you know, but unfortunately she, she doesn't take it like seriously. She just says something to me like, ah, you know, men does this. A cousin of ours once did it to me, this, that, mm. and the other. But I couldn't really talk about it with anybody. I just learned to deal with it on my own, you know? Like, mm. she just, like, kind of, like, just tells me, no, just be strong. You'll get over it, you know? That type of a thing. Mm. That's what happens. So I'm like, oh, okay. And I'm just like, oh, alrighty, maybe I'm also just being a big baby, you know, about the whole thing. So let me just tough it out, you know, let me just tough it out. So come Christmas and then everybody travels home, including Love and Joe. They also come home and then everybody spends Christmas together. So there was a best friend of mine. We had been like... um really tight since high school yeah. but she had like some family problems so whenever i was home like she would literally like move in and everybody at home was just like comfortable with having her around yeah mm. so that very december she comes over she spends time with us this that and the other and remember joe is also here at this time you know so he's back now uh, he's also home. He's home for the holidays. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. He also traveled home for the holidays. Mm -hmm. And so him and this best friend of mine, they, for some reason, get to a point where they exchange numbers with each other, mm -hmm. which was odd to me. You know what I mean? Mm. It was very odd to me. So, okay. Fair and fine. Then January comes. 
And then we all traveled back to Sweden. Remember, I'm still in school that side. Mm. We all traveled back that side, yeah? Um, So we traveled back. Everything is fine and everything is mellow. And then um, one random day, I get a text message on my phone from my best friend's cousin. You follow? (laughs) Mm. Uh. The cousin texts me and she says to me, um, you know, your friend is not who you think she is. And then I'm like, what do you mean? And then she says to me, no, your friend is a very sneaky person. And then I'm like, okay, what did she do? And then she says, well, your friend has been having conversations with your brother-in-law, Joe. At this point about your relationship, like whenever you tell him that you're having problems with the guy that you're dating, she goes and she tells it all to Joe. You know what I mean? Mm. So I'm like, okay, that is so strange. Like, why would you do that? And besides, why would my brother-in-law be so invested in my relationship? You know what I mean? Like, Mm. it's, 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 it's odd, you know? And then the cousin then like sends me like a couple of chats between them. Like when they were like actually making fun, because at this point, the relationship that I was having with this other guy, it was, it was quite strange, you know, because long distance relationships are inherently really hard. You know what I mean? Mm. So things were just not well between us. You know what I mean? Things were really, really just not well, you know? And so the cousin sends me like a couple of texts between them and they're just laughing about the problems that we're having because this best friend of mine is the one person that I was like constantly confiding in that this and that has happened between me and this guy, blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? Mm. She's the one person like I would literally tell everything concerning my relationship, you know? So I then I go and I confront Joe and I'm like, What's going on? First of all, what business do you have, like, talking to my best friend and stuff like that, you know? Like, it's so inappropriate in itself. Like, I don't think my sister would be happy knowing that this is what's going on, you know? Mm. So, the whole argument then escalates. Like, it just becomes, it just gets blown, not even blown out of proportion because it was out of proportion anyways. Mm. It's just a weird situation, you know what I mean? And then my sister comes because I think it was a Saturday when this thing happened and then she comes and then we just all get into like a really, really, really bad argument, you know? And we're just exchanging words and stuff like that. And so she's like, she's more like on his side and I'm just trying to show her that, look, he's the bad guy in this whole situation, but she's still taking his side. And then it gets to a point where I'm so frustrated and I'm like, look, but even that time when he did A, B, C, and D to me last year, you still brushed the whole issue aside. Mm. And then she, she finally says to me, no, you need to tell me what happened, this, that, and the other. And so now I'm there and I'm screaming and I'm telling her that, no, this person nearly raped me, blah, 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 you know, Mm. just explaining the whole situation to, to her, you know, just explaining the whole situation to her. And like, she's still like, kind of like taking it lightly. So at this point, you know, I'm feeling so emotional and I am feeling like so frustrated by the whole situation. I ended up calling my mom. I call my mom and I like just blurted everything out and I tell her everything that's been going on, you know, like even from the beginning of the whole year, you know, Mm. and then yeah, it's just like shit just hits the fan, you know, because now the secret is out. Everybody knows. And now it's just awkward, you know? Mm. So at this point I'm just like, you know what? I think I should just go back home. What did your mom say? She was just, she was really just downcast, you know, like when you weren't expecting something, like, you know, like when a bomb is just dropped on you, like you're just shocked, you know, you're just really, really shocked. And at this point when I'm talking to her, I'm crying and stuff like that, you know, 
Mm. Because I'm also like really emotional at this moment in time, Tinto. So yeah. And then I'm just like, you know what? I think I should just go back home because I don't think this is gonna work out at all. You know what I mean? Mm. And then my mom has a conversation with my other sister. And then my other sister gives me a call. She's like, no, maybe we didn't handle the situation correctly that time when you spoke to me about it. So let me book you a flight, pack a bag and let me book you a flight. And then you can come over and then maybe we can explore some trauma counseling, this, that and the other. And Mm. then you can go back to Sweden and then maybe we can find you your own place to stay. And, um, you can then go back and finish school because I don't think it's a good idea for you to just go back home and just be there, you know, Mm -hmm. when you don't have a life plan. Mm. So I'm like, okay, that's fine. So she does exactly that. And I leave that very same night. I go to my other sister. um, And then, yeah, we do the whole trauma counseling thing, this, that, and the other, you know, the works. Um, but you know, like counseling is not like a one-time fix. It's not yeah. like I can attend counseling for a week and then the next thing I'm just brought back to life. Mm, yeah, like <laughs> you l- know like I a mean? fine overnight. It doesn't work like that. Exactly, no. it mm-hmm. doesn't work like that. It has to be an ongoing process. But at this point in time, we're racing against time because back in Sweden, the semester has already started. So mm-hmm. I also need to like get back to school. You know, I can't like be here for much longer. So anyways, um, I go back to Sweden and then, yeah, I find a place to stay, you know, it's an, it's an okay, it's not, it's not really okay. It's not ideal because remember I've been staying in this, in these people's house. So food, the internet and everything that you could basically need is being covered for you. And now all of a sudden you're supposed to survive on like, a limited um a limited budget you know what i mean mm. so it's a huge adjustment to make so that in itself is now also becoming like a source of stress for me mm. you get what i mean it's also now becoming like a source of stress for me so i then wind up finding a job like part time work to just like try and make things come together But then that as well is also like a really huge strain because I have to be in school and I have to be at work at the same time, you know, like I'm just juggling these two things and I'm just trying to make both of them work. And it just like becomes like a source of stress for me as well. And unfortunately, the people that I was living with, because I was sharing an apartment with three other girls, like Mm. they weren't that much like of a good influence so i just got into drinking and partying and occasionally some drugs here and there you know like life just took a turn for the worst you know yeah just took a turn for the worst and it was so bad because i just felt like at this point i didn't really have anybody to talk to you know it was just me riding this wave you know like just going with it you know what i mean and i'm just trying to survive you know Mm -hmm. and yeah so at this point already as well now that i've also moved out love and i's relationship has just gone down the drain like it's literally almost non-existent at this point you know like we live in the same country like but we can go like maybe two or three months without talking to each other or seeing each other. And the thing is we lived pretty close to each other, but we would go for so long Mm. without talking to each other. And Joe is the one for the most part who does the checking up on me. You know, he's the one who calls me more than my own sister to check up on me, you know, and say, Hey, are you fine? Or what? But at the same time, it's you, you, it's you who caused this whole situation, exactly. to be yeah, like yeah. This, you know, so I don't feel like you have a place like yep. checking up on me, you know, yep. it's, it's just, it's crazy anyways. 
So then what happens is I then break up with the guy who I was initially dating because the long distance was just not working out. Yeah, it was working, yeah, yeah. It mm. was just not working out. So we break up and yeah, it's just that. And then a couple of months down the line, I meet a different guy. Remember, I'm now a party girl and stuff like that. We're going out mm. to parties every weekend, this, that, and the other, partying up a storm, you know. I meet up with a different guy and, yeah, it's a good time, you know. And then him and I end up deciding to date each other. So now we're exclusively dating each other and... He is just as much into the life of the party, you know, like, so as you are. Yes. yeah, so every other weekend, like we're at clubs, we are doing this and that, like we would literally party until like 4 a.m. in the morning on a Sunday and I'm supposed to be at work the Monday at eight, at eight in the morning. That's how hard we used to party, like. We would yeah. even get calls like from the clubs, like, oh, where are you guys this weekend? We need you guys to come like and hype the place up. The place is like really down when you're not there. That's how bad it was. Mm. <laughs> That's how bad it was. So yeah, that was the type of life that I was living. So um, yeah, then the end of the school year comes and then I... I come home for the holidays and it's fine. Everything is fine. And then the following year, this is now 2018. I go back to Sweden for my third year there now. Mm -hmm. I go back there. And unfortunately, my schedule for that year, like, would not allow me to work at the same time. Like, things were just getting so, so hectic at school, like, I just did not have the time, like, to work, you know? Yeah, and so yeah. now I am forced to quit my job, you know? And my finances, like, things are, like, so bad because I'm, like, getting, like, an allowance from my other sister. But it's also not really much, you know what I mean? After I've paid my rent and I've done this and that, it's just, like... It's not much at all. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Mm -hmm. It's really not, not much at all. And I am struggling, you know, like struggling to a point where I can't even afford like to buy like my sanitary wear as a girl. Yeah. Like, I can't afford to do that. That's how bad things are. Mm. So this guy that I'm dating then says to me, no, you know what? I think we should move in together because I think like if we moved in together, it would make much more sense because we have only one rent and then um, it will be much easier. Then we can use the rest of the money that you get and the money that I get um, to just like live off of, you know, because at this point he's also a student and I'm also a student. So we're both living like off of. Yeah money student. that we're getting yeah, yeah. student budgets student you know money. yeah yeah. Mm. yeah so it seems like an ideal situation and i'm like okay and at this point in time he is working on his thesis his final year project so meaning like that he has like just a couple of months left and then he will be done with school yeah yes. so that happens we move in together and the first two to three months are quite okay. Like, we're, we're just good. We're chilling. It's a good time, you know. And the thing is, I have not said back at home that I'm living with this whole other person, you know. Like, you know, mm. our African parents, like, I can't go back home to no, my mom. No, no, tell no, her, no. Like, ways. No <laughs> ways. You don't do that. Mm -mm. Yeah, I'm not going to tell her I'm living with a whole man. <laughs> you know what I mean? So... Mm. So, yeah, and then um, we're living together, and yeah, so then he finally gets done with his thesis and stuff, yeah? So he's like, he's done, done with school, and then his dad is like, you know what, since you're done with school now, um, I don't think I'm going to be supporting you financially anymore. Oof, I need okay. you to... It's, it's time for you to fend for yourself, young man. Yeah. I need mm. you to pick up the slack and do things on your own. 
Yeah, so he says, mm. no, I'm not going to be doing nothing for you because I've been like supporting you for the past four years. So now you're on mm. your own, my friend. So yeah, do your thing. It's either you're going to stay there or you're going to go back home and try and figure mm. things out back home, you know? And so then he's like, no, I'm just going to try and figure things out at home because he had made a couple of contacts there and he had started like a company with some guys that he had met there like who were Swedish and stuff like that so he's trying to kick off this whole business thing you know and it's just not working out like it's just one struggle after the other so inevitably like our relationship just starts to get toxic you know because when you're in a relationship and you guys don't have money like the inevitable is you're gonna be always frustrated you know Mm-hmm. And the relationship is going to get toxic. Let's not lie to each other. Relationships don't work with no money in them. Yeah. And especially if you've got bills and stuff, you know, like it's just not going to work, you know. So that whole year was just like, you know, it was just hard, you know. And mm-hmm. again, I started like to have like these depressive episodes, you know. And it got so bad to the point that I attempted suicide at this point Ooh, because melody. I had, yeah, I had just about had it at this point in time. I attempted and obviously I'm still here, so it means it failed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Anyways, the relationship gets toxic and then he says to me, no, I can't be with you when you like this, blah, 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 you know. Um, so I think we should break up this, that, and the other. And I'm like, nah, we're going to stick it out, buddy. We are going to stick it out because now what exactly do you want to do? And bear in mind that when he says this to me, it's like mid month. And number one, I've paid the rent for where we're staying. So like, if you're telling me that you don't want this to work, so like, where am I supposed to go? (laughs) Where am I, where am I supposed to go? I'm not leaving, you know, we're just going to stay here and stare at each other. It is what it is, buddy. You know what I mean? Mm. So, yeah, we just continue staying together, but it becomes like so, so hard, you know, like being there because we're just always when you at each other. So anyways, um, I reach out to love and I tell her what's been going on. Like, no, we've been staying together with this person, this, that, and the other, but the situation's just getting toxic or well, what. Can I maybe like come and crash with you for a few days until I get money? Because at this point, the person like who was like supporting me financially is our other sister. So I'm like, no, can I just come and crash at your place for a few days until she sends me more more money? Then I can mm-hmm. what? Then I can look for a place to stay. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And then she's like, oh, okay, no, it's what? It's fine. You can come over. So I'm just trying to pucker up the courage, like to pack my bags and leave. You know? And mm-hmm. then love then goes behind my back and then she goes and she tells our other sister that no this is what has been happening she's been staying with this guy blah 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 blah. you know what I mean she just Mm -hmm. goes and she makes the whole thing sour for me so now our other sister is upset at me about this whole thing you know Mm-hmm. And then she decides that she's not sending me any more money because she's like, nope, you're grown. You're staying with a man. So make a way for yourself. Mm. Just do things on your own, you know. And then our other sister then goes and tells our mom that this is what has been happening. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. so suddenly, like, the whole thing is just, like, a really, it's now just, like, a shitty, shitty situation, you know. Mm-hmm. And I think at this point, it was, like, around about September, and the semester usually would end at around October, November, there about. So it yeah. was just about, like, a month or two before the semester ends, you know. And then I can finally, like, just go back home, you know? So suddenly, like, because I don't know, like, 
that's what's going on. That's what has happened that everybody is now aware of the situation. I'm mm-hmm. just seeing I'm not getting an allowance anymore. Like even when I do get an allowance, like it's a ridiculous amount of money. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Mm-hmm. It's not so, something that, that really sustains life. Exactly. Yeah. So I end up not moving out from that guy's place. I end up not moving out. So we're just staying there together, you know. We are still quote unquote together, you know. It's just mm. the relationship of convenience at this point in time. Like we're just tolerating each other, you know. Um mm. and then yeah, so finally comes the end of the year. My mom books me a flight and she's like, No, I need you to come home, come straight home. This yeah. year you're not going to your sister, just come straight home. So at this point I can already feel that mm, okay, something's tense here, you know. Like you know mm-hmm. when you can see what corn in the offla. Yeah, so anyways, um I come back home. And when I get home, like my mom is just cold towards me, you know, and I'm just thinking, oh, okay, whatever. Um, I don't put too much thought into it. And I'm like, oh, yeah, whatever. It's fine. And then on one random day, she then just confronts me about the whole thing. She's like, yeah, I know what you've been doing, this, that and the other, you know, and she just starts going off at me, you know. And at this point, I am also emotional, you know what I mean? I'm also Mm. very, very emotional because I'm like, no, first of all, I haven't been getting the support that I feel I should have been getting because first of all, you should ask yourself like what led me to that whole situation, you know what I mean? Like it it wasn't a situation of my own making, you know what I mean? Mm Mm-hmm. It was the circumstances that forced me to do that. Like, it's something that I wouldn't normally do because I like to think I'm quite a morally upright person, you know, with the way that I was raised, you know. But Mm. everybody makes mistakes, you know. So, anyways, um, fast forward to December of that year. My other sister comes she also comes home for the holidays and then there's like a whole intervention for me because love has told everybody in the family that I'm drinking I'm doing this and that I even tried to kill myself blah 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 you know like but I feel like the way that she narrates the whole thing she just makes me look like the bad person in the whole situation, like I acknowledge like that I did some crazy things, you know, like I did some absolutely absurd things as well, you know, Mm. but also the way that she has narrated the whole thing. She has just made me look like a really bad person because also remember at this point in time, I am knee deep in depression about everything that's gone on. Because my family hasn't really addressed the whole thing the way that I thought it would be addressed. Mm -hmm. It was kind of like that whole thing of, no, we're sorry this happened to you. And then the next thing, it was just swept under the rug. And then Joe is just accepted back into the family and it's just business as usual. As if nothing ever happened, yeah. Yeah, as if nothing ever happened and everybody's just called it a day you know so that in itself is a source of depression for me you know so anyways my sister comes and then she's like yeah no uh anyways so for next year i'm not gonna be able to pay your fees so i don't think it's it's a good idea for you to go back to sweden this that and the other so you're just gonna stay at home you're not going back there and this is supposed to be my final year there yeah So now I'm asking myself, okay, so now what am I going to do? Because I don't have a plan. Like I've been building up to my degree. And one thing about me was that even though I had all of this going on Tinto, I was still at the top of my class. Like Mm. I was going to graduate cum laude. That's how good I was like at what I was doing. Like even though I was going off the rails, partying and doing all of that stuff. I was 
still like doing well in school because I really, really loved what I was doing. Like it was a lifelong dream. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I, I made sure I made sure. So yeah, she's like, Nope, you're not going back there. Don't have the money for it. And I'm like, Oh, okay. So yeah, I just leave it at that. And then the following year comes, this is 2019. And there I am. I'm a college dropout. Don't have a plan for my life. Like I'm just at home, Tinto, and the depression just starts eating away with me. Like my depression is now like on pro max level. Like, you know, like you're now spending your days day in, day out. You're just at home, uh, twindling your thumbs, you know, like you have nothing mm. to do. It's going to drive you crazy. You know what I mean? Mm. And then I don't really remember how the argument with love started because we had like a group chat as sisters. So I don't really remember how the whole argument started, you know. And then she then said something to me like, yeah, I know how you seduced my husband, this, that and the mm. other. And in my head, I'm like, what? We've had this conversation a couple of times over. So where is this coming from? And so, yeah, that was at the point where our relationship pretty much broke up. And yeah, till this day, really, <laughs> that's that's been it. So, so as far yeah. as she's concerned, you're the one who was seducing Joe. Yeah. As far as she's concerned. And she's but never really tried to find out from you what really happened as a sister. No, she has. We've had yeah. the conversation a couple of times over. But, and but the conversation is, the conclusion is basically we're going to continue as if nothing ever happened. Yeah, basically. Like, I feel like even at this point, you know, Tinto, like sometimes I, I, I struggle with a lot of resentment yeah. towards my family because I just yeah. feel like the whole thing wasn't like handled really well. Like, I mean, even now, when whenever I do bring it up, I feel like I am sort of gaslit by my family mm. into like saying no, get over it, stuff like that. I mean, like a couple of months ago, I tried to have a conversation about it with my, with my mom and my dad. And yeah. my dad basically said to me, well, if it happened, then you should have gone to the police. <laughs> That's what he said to me. So he's basically saying you chatting shit. Yeah. Yeah. Basically. So, yeah. You know what? Um, sad, sad to say, this is very similar to a lot of the trauma mm. that a lot of women have to deal with. And mm. the fact that their reality is never taken as reality. Yeah. You know, they, it, it, it's almost one of those to say you got to prove that this was real instead of your word being sufficient. Exactly. Exactly. Which is all the reason that a lot of women who've gone through this kind of thing would still feel like it's better not to say anything because the outcome and the desired outcome is never really taken at face value. Exactly. You know, like for a long time, like I just said to myself, you know what? I should have probably never spoken out about this whole thing because even with speaking out and telling my family about what happened, um, I don't think it did much good. If anything, it um, made me even worse, you know? But then the part of me saying that I learned not to engrave my trials in marble and my triumphs in sand comes at the point that, you know what, after that whole year that I had to endure, like being a college dropout and stuff like that, I actually managed to find like a really good job. And ever since then, I've been fending for myself. So I said to myself, okay, maybe if I had continued the situation of being dependent on my sister and stuff like that I wouldn't have come to a point where I was so desperate like to look for work and stuff like that and just try and make myself a better person maybe I was just going to continue being this person who's used to hand out and stuff like that you know yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah just so you know um there's something known as the center for women's justice Mm -hmm. which which really looks at, at at why the justice system continues to fail rape survivors mm -hmm. and and the things that need to change mm 
Mm-hmm. So what you've shared here is exactly what they are talking about. Mm-hmm. To say that there is insufficient support from the nuclear family to begin with. Forget the justice system, mm-hmm. right? The nuclear support system where you are supposed to find refuge, strength, and support mm-hmm. to back you up mm-hmm. is failing. Yeah. So if that is failing, what confidence can you have in a system that just doesn't seem to recognize it. I know South Africa has a hot potato for this and, and mm-hmm. Zimbabwe itself is very similar. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's almost the, it's almost as if they want to say, show us the evidence of rape. Exactly. You know, yeah. before we, we would go ahead and prosecute this person. So what are they really asking for? 90% of the time, it's not going to be a police officer, a police officer who's medically trained to say that mm-hmm. something has happened down there. Mm-hmm. You know, so so what is it that you're really fighting for? And what this paper is basically saying is that because of the deteriorating um, justice system, that it continually failing women, mm-hmm. rape continues to be on the up and will always be like this until yeah, yeah, the nuclear family. Forget the justice system. They say until the nuclear family recognizes mm. Mm. that this thing is endemic. It's true. And it's needs true. to be recognized. And those who are victims of it need mm. to be supported, period. Mm. It's true. So what happened is the other time um, I overheard like Love talking to my mom, telling telling my mom that their daughter with Joe, like um, she she doesn't want her to like touch her private parts like when she her and stuff like that and you know like the daughter's just so overprotective over her body and so I said to my mom yeah you know what I hope one day it's not a story of the father has been raping this child you know you know you know what mm. it's funny you say that I hear one too many similar stories Mm, mm. So, yeah, I said that to my mom and she just looked at me like I'm crazy. And I was like, yeah, no, we'll hear the story one day. It's not like I wish for that to happen, but yeah. it's quite odd to me, you know. It's a very, You know very that a mother can't even do that to her own daughter. Exactly, exactly. Mm. So, yeah. Now, lady, That's... this was heavy for me, man. Uh, you know yeah, what I but, think, but but in the same breath, I'm um, I'm also happy that you are out here to talk about it because the mm. reason why this podcast works is there are genuine real life lessons, and I know I am confident mm. somebody has listened to this, and the whole time you were saying something, they were going mm hmm mm hmm mm hmm mm. because they can relate. Yeah, and this is honestly maybe one of the first time that I can talk about this whole thing without actually crying because yeah. it usually like used to like touch a very hard place. Enough, yeah, mm. yeah. And it would like really, really make me sad. But uh, now I've just, I don't know. I've also started attending counseling on my own because yeah. I just said, you know what? I can't continue to let this thing control me like a pawn i'm not a pawn Mm. on a chessboard or something i need to find the help that i need because it's gonna make me a very bitter and an angry person like i'm saying to you that i struggled with a lot of resentment like towards my family for a very long time because at this point right now I am the main breadwinner at home so it was more of a thing of when I needed you to help me you were not there but now you're entirely dependent on me you know what I mean Mm. so it was it was quite a very hard place for me to navigate but I am learning to deal with them motions every day it's not easy there's days when it hits me like really hard and I can't like get out of bed because I actually like long for the relationship that I had with my sister because we used to be best friends she and I but that whole thing just went to trash because she chose a side and she chose to stick to it so I have to respect that you know what I mean yeah, 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 and yeah. I can't really convince her otherwise. If that's what she chooses, then it's it's fine. <laughs> so yeah, Naledi, thank you so much for sharing this, man. Um, 
I I wish you peace and comfort in the support that you have with the therapist you're dealing with. Mm-hmm. Continue that for as long as is necessary and is affordable. Mm-hmm. Because lesson number two for me is really important in all of this. And that's the one I'm mm-hmm. going to start with. It says sometimes you need to come to a point where you forgive. Mm-hmm. Not that because they have apologized or acknowledged the pain they caused, but because your soul deserves it. Mm. Right? Yeah. Choose peace always. Yeah. And then lesson number one is sometimes it be your own people. That is very clear. And, le- and last but not least, don't engrave your trials in marble and your triumphs in sand because you've got so much more to celebrate than everything that has happened from people that still do not acknowledge yeah. what they've done wrong. Yeah. So thanks a million for sharing this, man. I really appreciate it big time and I appreciate you big time. All righty. No, thank you for listening. It was nice to talk about it with somebody who didn't like have a lot of judgment to say, oh, you should have done this and that and that, mm. <laughs> you know. Yeah. No, you're welcome. You're welcome, Naledi. Mm. And for those listening to this episode of The Feeling Station, thank you for for listening. The support that you give in the term, in the way of the ear that you've given goes a long way, one, in supporting Naledi to begin with and in also supporting the podcast. You've been listening to another Feeling Station episode. I'm your host, Tinto, and I will catch you in next weekend's episode. Peace. Peace.